housing, we got our main venue for free, uh, this room right here. So let me introduce you to 111 Carroll. This is UNC's highest tech teaching classroom. We're all very proud of it here. I taught in this room for well over a decade back when it was stadium seating. They actually had 400 in the room. Uh, now it's 200 in this different format. I spent the past two years teaching in the junior version of this room. Uh, it, it houses, it, it holds half as many students. There aren't desks, they're on wheelie chairs so they can move around in different combinations. And it's quite an experience uh, teaching in a, a room like this. Uh, it takes a lot of getting used to. Uh, the strangest aspect is you don't stand down there at the front of the classroom, you stand in the middle. They, they, there's training sessions you go through. You stand in the middle and you speak in the round. And so we'll be doing that. Since we're gonna have a lot of discussions during this meeting, I think that would be helpful for the, the, uh, the, uh, the moderator to stand up here and we'll bring uh, the panelists up front as well, but we'll try to get everyone involved. So standing in the middle is part of it. And we have the tables here that uh, seat four, so that facilitates collaborative work. And we're gonna be doing collaborative work uh, during the workshops a little bit, but particularly on the third day of the conference when we produce this masterful, exciting document, uh, we'll be working in groups. Uh, you notice there are whiteboards and markers at every table. And so that will help with brainstorming and group work and all that stuff. What else? The uh, screens, we won't use this capability, but it's really cool when you're teaching, the students have access to the screens. If you allow it, they, we have the control center up there, Reed's working on it, and we can, uh, we're not gonna use it that much, but you understand how it works. Students can be working at their tables and then they project their work up on the screens to show their section or the whole classroom. So that's a nifty feature of the room. Now a feature of the room that we will be using a lot, and I wanna get you comfortable with this, and not shy. We're gonna have discussions, hopefully arguments, fights. There's blood on the floor. I think that's a good thing. It means we're making progress. We're having the difficult discussions. And I want everyone involved and it helps if you have microphone access. So each section has a throw mic and uh, I'm gonna get you used to this now. It's, uh, it's, you got yours over there. Whoever is closest to the throw mic, go ahead and pick it up. We're gonna do a little exercise here. Okay, there's one in every section. I want you to speak into it. Say the word one. 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 Okay. I should have heard six. Now, someone else in the section request it. You can be polite, wave your hand. You can be vocal. You can say, give me the damn thing. And toss it, yeah, toss it. One. Now, two. if you miss the person, it's okay. One. You're not here to play basketball. We have people to do that. So, yep, You're toss it, okay, uh, now say two. 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 Okay, this is how everyone's gonna get accustomed. First section to 10 wins, go. Three. 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 Four. Four. Five. Five. Working? Four. Five. Five. Four Six. something. Five. Oh, well. Six. 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 Five. Seven. Seven. Eight. Oh, we got winners. Eight. Seven. Five. Okay, excellent. So, is it not working? We have eight. Yeah. Okay, you have to eat it. Okay, well, Reed will work on charging them during the breaks. Some of them may be a little bit low. Okay. A little bit about the format of this meeting, and then I'll stop talking and turn it over to Michael. So, uh, as the uh, title suggested, uh, this is going to be a mixture of new tech and dangerous questions. We spent a lot of time working on our dangerous questions. When we first announced the meeting, we thought it'd be more about the new technology uh, that we and others have been developing to make it easier for survey level students to do work that previously grad students would take days or weeks to do. Survey level students can now do in tens of minutes. And we wanna share this tech because I think it revolutionizes the way we teach. So that was the initial idea, and we're, we're still gonna do that, but it's more to break up the intense discussions that we're gonna have. So the basic idea here, uh, it, you all know these arguments. You know, everyone loves astronomy, so people sign up for our courses. Uh, some of us have very large enrollment sections, but roughly 10% of college students take introductory astronomy. And uh, from these students, we can, do two things. Uh, some of them, uh, we turn into the next generation of STEM professionals, STEM scientists, STEM majors. Uh, and for the rest of them, uh, 
Most of the rest of them, it, this may well be the last science course, last STEM course they take. So in either of those cases, uh, these courses, these Astro 101, as we're calling them, though they may have different numbers at different institutions, it's a huge responsibility. And the problem is, historically, there has been a, a disconnect, a big disconnect between the subjects that we teach in Astro 101 and what survey level students can actually do. You know, uh, go back 10 years and most of the stuff you're teaching them, uh, they can't actually do it themselves. You may have a lab course and they're using small telescopes or this or that, and they're doing different things, different than the stuff you're teaching in the lecture because you just couldn't touch it. But um, so, so what happens is they end up learning a bunch of facts instead of doing a bunch of science. And they're facts that are interesting, but they're not facts that they use in their everyday life. And so they're rapidly forgotten after the final exam. The famous Harvard video is an example of this. If you're not using these facts day in and day out, they're forgotten. So what are we doing with this 101? Are we wasting a great opportunity? These are the big questions that we're going to be talking about. But um, it's changing. They now can do the same things you're talking about in class uh, due to two reasons. One is uh, remote uh, telescope technology. The students can now gain access to professional telescopes around the world. UNC is home of Skynet, and we have the founder and director and other people from Las Cumbres here. And yep, right there, there's Wayne, founder. And, um, and other people have their own telescopes that they've set up. You can now get professional quality data right into the classroom really easily. And we'll demo some of this, but it's not really the focus of our new tech. The question is, once you get these images, what can you do with them? Can you turn them into the lessons that you're trying to teach in your survey level classes? And so we and others have been building all sorts of data analysis interfaces that take what used to take a grad student, as I said, hours, days to do. Now survey level students with no background can do similar analyses with real data, cutting edge data, some of which they may have collected themselves or they collected archivally, and they can do it in tens of minutes in a classroom frame. And I think this changes the whole game and we have to think about what we're doing in these classes and if it's still relevant anymore. And so we'll have a few workshops, a couple long ones, 70 minutes, some 35 minute ones, and we're not going to show you, you're going to do uh, as your students. Hopefully you'll gain some things that you can take back and do with your students. Now, that's the new tech. Uh, what's become the main goal of the conference are the dangerous questions. And um, you've read them. In fact, we had very, very high response rates, rates. We asked you to rank the dangerous questions. There's a lot of them. There are six categories. Why six? Well, we have six sections in this room. Each category had uh, at least nine questions. Why nine? There are nine tables in each section. So all this kind of makes sense. And you've read through them, you've ranked them, and uh, each will get 70 minutes for a discussion. And there's no way we'll get through all nine in 70 minutes. Uh, the goal is to get through at least five, but that's why you ranked them. We're going to talk about the ones and discuss and fight the ones you're most interested in. Uh, we'll have a moderator who will stand in the center like this, and um, we'll have panelists, which we'll bring up to these tables here. And the panelists have thought about the questions in their section. The panelists are drawn from amongst you, uh, not from the organizers. And they will kickstart the discussion with their own experiences, thoughts, ideas, opinions. But we'll very, the moderator's job is to turn this into a broader discussion across the room. That's why we have the throw mics. Or if you have a big booming voice, you can just speak up. I'm not a fan of orderly uh, get in line conversations. If you can shout over someone, I'm all for it. I, I want to have dynamic. Uh, it, it's called um, the um, chaos organization model. I just want us all to get into it and figure some things out. Perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Great. OK. Now, if you're shy and don't want to make a comment, uh, very soon after Michael, you'll hear, you'll hear from May, who has set up our Discord. Each dangerous question has its own thread on the Discord. And so you'll be able to put your own thoughts there, or you can summarize what you're hearing in the room, et cetera. And so by the end of the second day, once we've gone through all of our dangerous question se uh, sessions, 
we will, uh, the final thing we'll do is we'll take out the questions printed on cards and put them on each desk and you will find the question you want to shepherd on the third day, the question you're most interested in. And uh, each question will have two to four people. We don't want any individuals writing responses. They're not answers. These questions don't have answers. We're developing responses. And they should be bold and forward thinking, something that will um, maybe uh, have some kind of impact. And so you'll find if your table's already full up, make sure you have a second favorite dangerous question or a third favorite. And we'll pick our teams and then over socialization in the evening, maybe you can discuss or go out to dinner and discuss what you wanna do. Uh, we'll try to get an AI to summarize the discussion and we'll also have the comments and we'll put them in Google Docs. And the third day we're gonna do a lot of writing. Your team of two to four people will make a three page, uh, I'm sorry, a two page, we're looking for like just a two page response to this dangerous question. And uh, I'll just read it here. What the goal is, is to create an interesting forward-looking document that new educators and hopefully funding officers uh, will reference and can shape, direct, redirect the discussion about astronomy and STEM education in the years ahead. Okay. Now, with any document, any documents reflective of its authors, and, and, and so there's a clear bias. This, the bias of this document is the bias of the people in this room. So we should spend a little bit of time figuring out who you are. So I'm gonna turn this over to Michael. Uh, many of you filled out some of those poll questions at the end. So Michael's now gonna tell you who you are. Okay, yeah, that does work. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Fitzgerald and I'm from Las Cumbres Observatory. Uh, and I'm not going to take a lot of the time up, but most of you have done this survey that was online and it had two purposes. The first one was so we knew that what everyone, what priority everyone thought the dangerous questions should go in. And so that's the first thing that we've sort of got. And it's a different slide on my screen than on the board. There we go. So uh, after you answered all those, oh, that is weird. The slide on my screen is the next slide. Anyway, I'll just use the screen. So uh, we were able to rank uh, all of the dangerous questions um, in order of priority. And for each of uh, the six groups, that's helped the moderator to be able to figure out, um, you know, what questions to tackle first, what we might need to get through, and what might not be as important as each other. I will share these uh, slides somehow later on. I'm just giving you a general overview of that. So that's how we uh, organize the dangerous questions. But the interesting bit is we wanted to know who everyone is. And so uh, first question is, how long have we all been doing it? And There's a, this might be a lag. So about half of us have been doing stuff for over 15 years, uh, whereas the other half of us have been done kind of working from one to five years, five to 12, 12 to 15. So kind of evenly split between people who have been doing stuff for a long time and people who are pretty, relatively new. So that's good. So we've got a good mix of that. Uh, and what are our backgrounds? So most of us are astronomy, formal astronomy backgrounds. Not a lot of us are particularly got a doctorate in education or masters of education. But on the right we have, I've worked as a teacher at some type of institution. That's the vast majority of us. Uh, and just to get an idea what topics you teach in your classes, it was kind of, kind of evening, even nothing stood out. Some of the things that stood out were what we don't teach uh, computational astronomy, high energy astronomy, uh, and the more radio astronomy, gravitational waves, stuff like that. But mostly it's kind of an even spread across the content topics. Uh, and we had a look and saw what order you thought the content priority would be. So we can have a look at that more in the content section. Got a lag in. Okay. So for those of us who, uh, teach an undergrad. How many of you do practical labs? Most of you. 
How many of you do observing? About three quarters. How many use robotic telescopes? Just over half. And that is probably higher than the general population, considering LCO and Skynet are both here and represented. Uh, do you use a particular textbook? Uh, do you use clickers? So it's kind of half-half split. And then, you know, just broadly, what are your opinions? What's important to the students from your perspective? So everyone pretty much put 10 for understanding the nature of science and scientific inquiry. Um, pretty, high, <coughs> pretty high for the uh, appreciation for size, structure, and scale of the universe when it turns up. You just take my word for it. Uh, increased interest in astronomy as a lifelong learning activities. Relatively high, but not as important. Uh, seasons, phases, and eclipses, kind of important, not as dramatic as, uh, as other things. Um, stars, about the same level, kind of important. Understanding Milky Way, about the same level. Milky Way in the local universe, take my... And understanding of cosmology is about the same level, maybe a bit lower. Um, <clears throat> and here's the bit I'm interested in. Of course, the slide doesn't work. It's like students having hands-on experience with a telescope. So let me see if I can trigger that to come up. Oh, it's so confusing. So most people think that students should have a hands-on experience with the telescope. This is very strange. But um, so students have some experience of a telescope nearby or otherwise, or a hands-on experience. But to a lesser extent, uh, for a research grade telescope that's uh, more evenly, some people don't think it's very important. Other think, well, people still think it's highly, highly important. Um, and for students having a direct experience of the research, research projects, probably kind of evenly distributed. Uh, <clears throat> but um, students having an appreciate, appreciation of how astronomy impacts their history, lives, and future is relatively high. Um, and students getting an appreciation of practice, what the activities of practicing research astronomers do uh, is, pretty, is kind of medium high. So sorry for stumbling over that a little bit with the slides. But um, so do you engage with astronomy education research in your teaching? Uh, about 60% of us do that. Uh, do you perform evaluations in your class? Uh, most of us do informal evaluations. Some of us do full-on empirical research in the classroom, and only about 20% of us don't do evaluations at all. Uh, about half of us use concept inventories to explore student understanding, and that was my whirlwind trip through um, some partially working slides about who we are. So. Thank you very much. Made up for all the time I wasted. So, <laughs> so next up will be May, who's going to introduce us with the dis to the Discord and how to use it. Mike Michael has a working microphone. All right, hi everyone, I'm May. Uh, I am part of the local organizing committee, so like Dan said earlier, if you have questions, uh, look for me, look for Reed, and we will help you. Uh, one thing that we're gonna use a lot is the Discord, and so if you haven't joined already, uh, please work on that uh, kind of starting now, and I will be coming around to help you, so just let me know if you have questions or trouble joining. And I'm just gonna give you a quick tour just so that everyone understands, because it is a little bit confusing at first. Uh, but we have some stuff. You can ignore the rules, because I haven't gotten to that point yet. And uh, we also have some logistics stuff. So I will post in the from the organizers, which are announcements, um, so any changes when we get the parking resolved, things like that, I'll put an announcement here. Uh, you can also ask us questions. 
and try and get information from the organizers who will be joining the Discord now too, right? And uh, so feel free to ask us questions here and one of us will answer. Uh, if you need other just general help, uh, just there's a help channel. Amy, was that a hand up in the back? It is on the welcome page that you got. There's a QR code you can scan. And I will also make sure that the welcome document is in the Google Drive you have access to. Um, but there will be a link to it there too. The QR code is going to be fast. Thank you. So I will also just send around the actual link. Uh, as well. Um, so give me a few minutes and then I will sort that out. Uh, so for now, I'll fix the link, uh, but I can still give you a tour of what the Discord looks like. Uh, there are some social channels, so uh, you all can chat with each other. Uh, if anybody would like to make dinner plans or things like that, uh, we also have places where you can recommend your favorite food and drink. Uh, I like Karama and I suggest it for lunch because it's sushi and it's very cheap and I'm a grad student, so cheap is good. And then there's also just some other social channels. Uh, the big things, I'm adding the workshops as I get there. And for now, we're gonna start with the dangerous questions. Uh, so for the next discussion, when we're doing context, you can go to the channel that is the context questions. And it's a special type of channel where you can tag your post by what question you're talking about. And so you can find all of the posts from people who are talking about that question. I also made this master post right here, and this has all of the lists of questions for each category. So um, your tags, because of Discord, are question one, two, et cetera. And so here is the numbering scheme that I'm using. So this is in that category. And if I wanted to make a post I can choose the tag. So say I'm talking about question one, I can tag it with question one and then make my post. And you can reply to people's posts and you can also search through the channel by people who have posted with that tag. And once we have some uh, actual posts in the Discord, I can show you again what that looks like. It's just, it's very empty right now because it's just me. And so there's one of these for each of the categories. So context, content, engagement, beyond the classroom, and future research. And then we will also be setting up some channels for the workshops as well. So as we're going through things, if you want help with the Discord, Reed and I can both answer your questions. When Donovan and Andreas come in here, they can also help. The organizers can help. So don't be shy. There are no bad questions, right? So we are happy to help. Does anybody have any questions right now about the Discord besides the fact that the link's messed up? Yes. Yes, I uh, will come around. I will figure out where the pages are located since that I handed off to somebody else. And so give me a few minutes and then I will come around as we're going through things and I can help anyone who's having trouble. Yes. Uh, it is not up yet because I got distracted with other tasks, <laughs> but I will have it up shortly. Uh, like a proper grad student, I have forgotten several other things that I needed to do. So that is on my list. Uh, that'll be up shortly and it'll, I'll provide more to the instructions too as we have more posts, help for like navigating the forums and stuff like that. All right, feel free to just flag me down at any point if you have any questions. 